You're the guy single-handedly responsible for uh, transforming Dana White. We built a system of crisis medicine, not a healthcare system. And we have been led to believe that this is the system that's going to bring us to a state of optimal health. It's not. It's for crisis intervention. You want to see magic things happen in your body. Test for what it's deficient in and then just give it the raw material it needs to do its job. You'll be shocked how well it performs. So first, let me tell you four things that you can do that are absolutely free. Gary Brecker, so much to talk with you about. I mean, you're the guy single-handedly responsible for uh, transforming Dana White. We'll talk about that. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the background that brings you to where you are, because one of the things you used to do, fascinatingly, is predict how long people are going to live and when they're going to die. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Sure. I was a you know mortality expert for uh, large life insurance uh, companies and large life insurance policies. And what this meant was, we, you know, we know that everybody is on an actuarial curve. Both of you are on one. I'm on one. Everybody listening to this podcast is on one. You know, if you're a 34 year old male, you have a life expectancy of X. If you're a 25 year old female, you have a life expectancy of Y. But the truth is that um, when when an insurance company is getting ready to put um, specific risk on your life, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million dollars worth of life insurance on a single life, uh, only one thing matters. Um, and that's how many more months does that person have left on earth? And interestingly, insurance companies have data that no other financial services enterprise has. The federal government doesn't have it. Um, you know, universities and research foundations don't have it. And that is that they know the day, the date, the time, the location, and the cause of death for hundreds of millions of lives. And when you know that specific piece of information, you can pull it back into that person's records. Don't forget, they also have medical records on these people. They have blood work. They have some type of gene testing. They have all of their medical history. They have a blood test that they've done on their own. And so we take that data and we create pathways to predict how soon someone is going to die. And these, these predictions were done, you know, to the month. And I get a lot of flack about it, but the truth is it's some of the most accurate science in the world. You know, I've, I've said many times that the database that I had access to, if that database could ever see the light of day, it would permanently change the face of humanity. I mean, it would upend modern medicine in a way that would be catastrophic because we know the trajectory of these chemicals and synthetics and pharmaceuticals. We know what happens when people are just missing the basics in, um, in nutrition and, and supplementation. And we can accurately predict not only the onset of, but the severity of and how quickly somebody will succumb to disease or pathology. And you know, if you want to know how accurate they are doing this, just, just look at what happened during the 2008 and 2009, you know, financial services crisis. We had 364 banks fail. You didn't have a single life insurance company fail, not one. In fact, when the credit services division, um, derivatives division of AIG, one of the largest life insurance companies in the world, went south and almost took the entire company over, it was the life division that bailed them out. Um, a valid death claim in the United States has never failed to have been paid. Not once. There's not one valid death claim ever issued on a life that's failed to have been paid. They're some of the most solvent institutions in the world. And this is because they're very good at what they do, right? No other financial services enterprise would take that level of risk on a single variable. There's no venture capital fund, no angel investor, you know, no hedge fund, um, no mutual fund that would take that level of risk on, on just one single variable. So they really have honed in the science. And you know, what was astounding about being in that career was that, um, you know, as I started to spend more and more time in that career, I, I realized a number of things. Uh, number one, that there were, uh, it wasn't just data, right? There were human beings on the other side of these spreadsheets. Um, and even though you get brainwashed into being told that, hey, you have nothing to do with this case, you're not responsible for getting this person into this condition, you're not responsible for getting them out of this condition, at the end of the day, it became very hard to separate myself from the fact that there was a human being, you know, on the other side of the spreadsheet. And had I just been able to pick up the phone and call them, um, I could have materially changed the trajectory of their life. Um, I was precluded by law from doing that. Even if I saw life-threatening drug interactions, I could not pick up the phone and warn the patient. I couldn't even pick up the phone and tell the treating physician. And when you're looking at this voluminous amount of data, so my, my job was to basically read medical records for, for 20 years and 
to extract from the medical record the pertinent information needed to predict life expectancy. And when you're reading that voluminous amount of medical records, you start to see patterns. Um, you see that the, the reason why most people are not living healthier, happier, longer, more fulfilling lives are because of what we call modifiable risk factors. You know, things that people could change in their life most of them quite easily. They had to do with basics of activity, basics of nutrition, understanding the human biome, the fix, you know, anemias, vitamin D3 deficiencies, simple nutrient deficiencies that these people had that were dramatically reducing their quality of life. And that's why you'll hear me say, you know, every chance that I get that um, I have two sayings. One is that the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. Um, because we did not study a single disease etiological pathway, not one that did not have its roots in a lack of oxygen or was not exacerbated by a lack of oxygen. Everything from autoimmune diseases to Alzheimer's to dementia, um, to ADD, ADHD, OCD, manic depression, bipolar, all kinds of conditions, type two diabetes. And, and the second was that Human beings are, are not as sick as we think we are. We don't have pandemics of uh, mental illness and pandemics of um, uh, you know in genetically inherited disease. We have a pandemic of missing raw material in the human body. We have nutrient deficiencies that are leading to the expression of disease in most cases. You know, when you deprive the human body of certain raw materials, I mean, pick one, vitamin D3, for example, you get the expression of what happens when you deplete that nutrient, right? So compromised immune system. We know D3, for example, was uh, the second leading cause of morbidity in COVID. Um, deficiency in D3 is why COVID disproportionately affected minorities, not because their minority status, but because of the pigment of their skin, which actually drove their D3 levels down even lower. And and so if, if we would go back to the basics, put our faith back in humanity, back in mankind, back in what God gave us, and give the body the raw material it needs to heal itself, you would see magic things happen in this world. Gary, I want to get back to that in a second. But first, I'm just so fascinated by this idea of being able to accurately predict uh, people's life expectancy mm -hmm. on an individual level. Uh, particularly, you know, I think I'm pretty sure I have life insurance and, and the, the information you'd get about me would be like my age, uh, my sex, the fact that I broke my arm playing basketball a few years ago. And that's sort of probably about it. How on earth can you predict how long I'm going to live based on things as basic as that? So I, I worked in the jumbo life division. You're not going to get a life insurance policy over $5 million of face value without them sending a nurse out to your house and doing a blood draw, without them getting all of your demographic information, your trust, um, you know, your trusts, and wills, your divorce decree, if you were divorced, um, your banking information, your um, all of your health records as far back as they can go, usually five to 10 years. And, and then a specific blood test before the policy is incepted. So you can go online and get a term policy for a million dollars and, and submit some basic information. And that wasn't the life insurance division I worked in. I worked in the division of um, uh, whole life and universal life policies. These are policies that are meant to be carried all the way to term, um, not like a term life insurance policy. 98% of term policies never pay a death claim. Only 2% of term policies actually result in a death claim. So you could go on right now to any number of websites and say, I need a $100,000 10-year term life policy, and they're not going to send a nurse to your house, and they're not going to do an, a, a deep dive into your um, medical records because they know there's a 98% chance that that term policy will lapse. Because at the end of that five-year or 10-year or 20-year term, that policy goes to zero. It's usually meant to cover the breadwinner during the... Um, during the formative years, maybe, you know, um, maybe a mother or a father that's the working one, the other one's home with the kids. And, and if you lost that income, it would be catastrophic and it needs to be replaced. But 15, 20 years down the road, that insurance policy is no longer needed. When you talk about big whole life, big universal life policies, 5 million, 10 million, 25 million, 50 million in face value, which is a lot more common than you think. 
Um, and these are the policies where they are predicting um, life expectancy to the month and they're or using a third party life expectancy company. And they're very accurate with the data and the medical extraction. That makes sense. So what are some of the like key takeaways that that you would be looking for? What is the thing that you'd be like, oh, that's definitely telling me some really useful information. I'm looking for this. This is going to have a material impact. Like what are some of the, the basics? Um, so a lot of the basics were medical misdiagnosis, um, um, chronic conditions that were left untreated. So, for example, we would see over and over and over again. We know, for example, from a uh, from a uh, 2016 Harvard University study and then a repeated study by Johns Hopkins in 2019 that medical error is the third leading cause of death. Wow. So the number one killer of human beings worldwide is cardiovascular disease. The number two killer is cancer. The number three killer is modern medicine. It's a medical error. You're welcome to look that study up. Um, the 2016 study pegged it as the third leading cause of death. The 2019 study, it got worse. So they published the 2016 study and buried the 2019 study. <laughs> Um, but, you know, take, for example, a, a common thing that I would see in the medical record. Somebody comes in with a long term clinical deficiency in vitamin D3, the sunshine vitamin, which which I would argue is the single most important nutrient in the human body. Right. It's the only vitamin that a human being makes on our own. Um, there's scantily a single cell in the entire human body that lacks a receptor for this nutrient. It acts like a hormone. Sometimes it acts like a vitamin. We make it from sunlight and cholesterol. Um, I mean, just, just think for a second, if the human body only makes a single vitamin out of the hundreds of vitamins in your bloodstream, how important should that, do you think that nutrient is to human function? Well, 50% of the world is clinically deficient in this nutrient. Um, 85% of dark complected populations, African Americans, Latinos, Middle Eastern populations are clinically deficient in this nutrient. And very often, when you deplete vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, simple nutrient, the human body, you get the expression of other conditions. And I can't even tell you how many times, more times than I could count, um, a patient with a long-term clinical deficiency in vitamin D3 would go into their primary care physician and say, listen, doc, I, I wake up sore and achy in the morning, like, like I've had a workout the night before when I haven't, the soles of my feet, my ankles are sore when I get out of bed to walk to the bathroom first thing in the morning. You know, now my hips and my knees hurt. And lately it's, it's actually hard to make a really tight fist. And the, and, uh, the primary care doc goes, um, because of the parallel of that symptoms to something called rheumatoid arthritis, the primary care doc goes, you know what, you've got rheumatoid arthritis. I'm going to hit you with some high dose prednisone. You're going to feel a lot better. And then I'm going to put you on something called a corticosteroid. And this is just an oral capsule. You're going to take it every day and your joints aren't going to ache. And the truth is that um, once you started corticosteroids, we knew in the mortality space from decades of research that you had six years and one day until you were having a joint replacement. It was wow. so accurate that I would, if you were a 60-year-old female misdiagnosed with rheumatoid and you started corticosteroids, I would artificially advance your age six years and one day, and I would begin to reduce what's called your ambulatory profile, how well you move, how well you ambulate. And we know now that sitting is the new smoking, right? Sedentary lifestyle is the leading cause of all cause mortality. Right. So the more sedentary we become, the faster we're going to die. And I can give you the root cause of that. But, um, you know, we, 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 we just don't move much anymore. And so and this is why I, I also say that aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. <laughs> Society, we, we so aggressively pursue comfort that we accelerate our aging. Right. We have to stop telling grandma not to go outside. It's too hot. Not to go outside. It's too cold. Just to lay down, just to relax, to eat at the very first pang of hunger. This is collapsing all of our natural defense mechanisms. But if we go back to this D3 deficiency and um, you advance their age six years in one day, you schedule the joint replacement, you start to reduce the way that this patient ambulates, the, how mobile they are. And now once I reduce ambulation, I can bring in all of the diseases that exacerbate with reduced mobility, right? All of the cardiovascular conditions that exacerbate all the muscle atrophy, something called sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle wasting. And I can accelerate your decline and I can bring diseases forward from your future into your present most likely that you never would have had. So if you rewind this scenario, you were diagnosed with a condition that you did not have. You were put on a medication that you did not need, which caused you to have a joint replacement that wasn't required, which reduced your um, mobility unnecessarily and brought diseases from your future into your present. 
you died from a condition you never should have had because you were diagnosed with a disease that you didn't have, put on a medication that wasn't required and, and had, had a surgery that was unnecessary. And this happens way more often than you think. And as soon as we would see that, we call these anchor diagnosis because as soon as you are diagnosed with a disease or a condition, rheumatoid, manic depression, bipolar, ADD, ADHD, type two diabetes, a high blood pressure, hypothyroid, as soon as you're diagnosed with any of these conditions, it's anchored in the record. And every physician that treats you from that day forward just carries forward that diagnosis. They don't go back and say, hey, I wonder if this physician pulled SED rates and rheumatoid factors. And I wonder if they actually did the right testing to determine if this condition existed. No, they accept that diagnosis and they pull forward from there. Once you're hypertensive, you're always treated as a hypertensive patient. Once you're rheumatoid, you're always treated as a rheumatoid patient. Once you're Crohn's disease autoimmune, you're always treated as Crohn's disease autoimmune. And we found a paucity of understanding in the, um, of what these chemicals and synthetics and pharmaceuticals would do. I mean, we knew that opiates had an addictive amyloid long before you ever heard of the pain addiction crisis, right? We, we knew that patients weren't off of this. Why? Because we had all of their medical records and we could see that they were going to the VA and going to a primary and going cross state lines to another doctor and getting pain medication. And they clearly had an addiction. And, and then we would give them very little chance of getting off of that addiction, or we would walk them on to other addictions. Pain medication is a rich man's addiction. Heroin is a poor man's addiction. And so- Gary, can, can I just stop you there? Look, what you're saying is fascinating and heartbreaking at the same time, because you're describing a system that whilst well-intentioned is making people even more sick. No question. So, so I guess my question is, how can this be allowed to happen? And in a society which is liti as litigious as the United States, how come there haven't been thousands of lawsuits because of this? Well, there have been thousands of lawsuits. I mean, there are multi-billion dollar class action payouts every single year. Go, um, you know, watch the um, uh, documentary on the opiate crisis. Nobody mm -hmm. was criminally charged. Um, but billions of dollars were paid out. But if you make $18 billion on a drug and you settle a $2.5 billion lawsuit, understand that profits are not clawed back. Fines are inflicted. And so there's a, there's a, um, there's a certain amount of legal reserve for every single one of these um, you know, um, can, you know, pharmaceuticals. And again, I'm not attacking big pharma. And mm -hmm. I am not attacking you know, the government saying there's a conspiracy theory to kill us. But we built a system of crisis medicine, not a healthcare system. And we have been led to believe that this is the system that's gonna bring us to a state of optimal health. It's not, it's for crisis intervention. I mean, if I hit a windshield at 20 miles an hour, or 30 miles an hour, I'm going to the ER. I want a surgeon, I want pain medication. I want, to, if I get pain in my shoulder, you know, uh, radiating down my arm, I'm going to the emergency room. I'm not anti-modern medicine. But what I'm saying is putting a state of optimal health for human beings in the hands of modern medicine, which is where it is now, is a very poor choice, right? I mean, I, I remember when um, uh, I, I was in grad school and I was getting my second biology degree, this one in human biology, and, and I had to take all these plant botany courses. And, you know, I hated them, but you have to take them. And um, so I'm there studying plants. And the, and the one thing that kept striking me was that, it does not matter what goes wrong in the leaf or the branch or the trunk of a tree or br brush shrub. If you call a true botanist or a true arborist out to your house, they won't touch the leaves that are rotting in the top of the tree. They will core test the soil. And then they'll look at the soil and they'll say, you know what? There's no nitrogen in this soil. And they'll add nitrogen and the leaf will heal. And we've stopped thinking about human beings this way. Right? We've lost all faith in mankind and humanity. And we, we, we don't look for nutrient deficiencies in human beings. We assume that diseases are genetically inherited. And in many cases, that is patently false. The majority of diseases we call genetically inherited are not disease passing from generation to generation. It is an inability for the body to refine a raw material for example, taking folic acid and turning it into the form the body uses called methylfolate. You inherit genetic deficiencies in a metabolic process called methylation, which leads to those diseases.
You didn't inherit hypertension in most cases. You didn't inherit a gene that gave you hypothyroid. You didn't inherit a gene that gave you hypercholesterolemia, hyperinsulinemia, hypertension, depression, anxiety. You inherited an inability from your ancestor to refine a raw material. This caused a deficiency, which led to that condition. And these deficiencies can be fixed. And so this is this is the the entire point, right? I mean, if if if, if that tree were truly diseased, you'd have to send somebody up the ladder and start cutting off the branches and trimming the leaves and skinning the trunk. But the truth is, there was nothing wrong with the tree. It was deficient in raw material. And human beings um, have become super deficient in basic raw materials. Our food supply is is hyper depleted now because of the, what we put into the soil. Um, our water supply has fluoride and chlorine, and phosphates microplastics. Um, it has, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals. These get into the body and they disrupt the metabolism of the body. It's, it's, you know, a lot of what I preach about is just getting back to the basics. You know, meat is attacked. Um, the truth is most meat is very, very healthy for you if it's grass fed and grass finished. But the, when we industrial raise cattle on corn syrup and and soybean uh, powder, which they're never eating naturally in nature, of course, the meat fills with pus and we get a disproportionate ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 and we're putting inflammatory compounds back in the human body. And so what was fascinating to me was that, you know, I wanted to pick up the phone and call those patients and be like, hey, you don't have rheumatoid arthritis. Just take some vitamin D3 and get off the methotrexate um, because this is impairing your ability to absorb other nutrients. And the first thing that would happen is the consequences of these medications. We knew, for example, you know, back to corticosteroids, you take a corticosteroid, it shuts your gut down. As soon as you shut your gut down, you reduce the nutrients you absorb. When you reduce the nutrients you absorb, you compromise the immune system. You compromise the immune system and nutrients, you have a problem with cell walls, cell membranes, and hormones. Now you're hormone deficient. You're not exchanging um, um, and eliminating waste through the cell wall like you were anymore. Inflammation starts to rise in the body. And now this myriad of conditions shows up a few years down the road that you never would have had had you just put the right raw material back into the human body. I'll get you back to the interview in a minute. But first, let me recommend a product that we use all day, every day at Trigonometry Towers. Look, going online without ExpressVPN is like using your smartphone without a protective case. Most of the time, you'll probably be fine, but all it takes is one accidental drop onto solid concrete to make you wish you'd protected yourself. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network in cafes, hotels, or airports, anyone on the same network can gain access to your data. I'm talking all your passwords, financial details, the lot. And it doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack someone. A smart 12-year-old could do it. Hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling personal info on the dark web. A grand? Why am I not doing that? ExpressVPN helps to keep you safe by creating a secure, encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that hackers can't steal your sensitive data. It's super secure. It'd take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. It's also dead easy to use. Fire up the app and click one button to get protected. And it works on all devices, phones, laptops, tablets, and more. So you can stay secure on the go. We use ExpressVPN at Trigonometry because it's a simple, easy, and effective way to protect our data. And it means I can watch my feminist websites in peace. Secure your online data today and get three months for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash trigger. That's e x p r e s s v p n dot com slash trigger and get an extra three months free. Now, back to the show. It's very interesting you say that, Gary. And what do you say with with genetic with genes such as the BRCA gene, which people have isolated and said, you know, if you have BRCA one, I think it's you're ninety percent more likely to develop breast cancer. If you have BRCA two, I think it's eighty percent. Yes. So there are genes, not, not, not all of them, there are genes that predispose you to certain conditions, and there are some genetically inherited diseases. But let me promise you something. 64% of the world's population does not have hypothyroid. 
55% of the world's population is not hypertensive. They don't have the disease hypertension. If you actually look at the categories of these diseases, just take hypertension, for example, 85% of all hypertensive diagnosis, meaning the diagnosis of high blood pressure, are idiopathic. What's idiopathic mean? It means of unknown origin. So that means only 15% of the diagnosis of high blood pressure, we can point to the cause. Yes. That means 85% of the time, we have no idea what's causing it. And what do we do? We medicate the heart. We medicate the heart for a crime it's not committing. The majority of people that have um, high blood pressure have a normal EKG, a normal EEG. They have normal heart and lung sounds. They have a normal dye contrast study. They have normal cardiac catheterizations. So why are we still medicating the heart? Because we're not looking at the biome. We're not looking at the fact that this, this hypertension that ran in this family, because it is familial, meaning genetically runs in the family, does not mean that disease hypertension is being passed from generation to generation. In rare cases, it is. But what it means is that we have passed a gene mutation interrupting the ability for the body to refine a raw material. In most cases, it's an amino acid called homocysteine. This is what happened with Dana White. Um, and if, if homocysteine rises in the bloodstream, as it's cruising by the inside lining of the artery, it irritates the artery. When you irritate an artery, it clamps down. If you make the pipes smaller in a fixed system, pressure goes up. And so now the pressure is rising, but there's nothing wrong with the heart. So we examine the heart, there's nothing wrong, and we say we don't know what causes it, and we medicate the heart. So now you're medicating a perfectly healthy organ, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, diuretics. What are these doing? They're stripping nutrients out of the body, potassium, magnesium, sodium, electrolytes. Well, what needs electrolytes to function? The heart. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting dichotomy of how we're so myopic when we look very often at disease. Some of the worst research ever done on this planet is when we study cells or organs in human beings in isolation, right? Not a single cell in your body exists in isolation. In fact, if you want to cut a, a human being's life expectancy in half, any person walking this earth, no matter what age they are right now, they can be 15, they can be 50. You want to cut their life expectancy in half? put them in isolation. You will cut their life expectancy by 50%. This is what happens to cells in isolation. You know, they're in an environment where they're exchanging frequency, they're exchanging electrochemical signals, they're exchanging with their outside environment, they're eliminating waste, they're repairing, they're detoxifying, they're dividing. And then we pull the cell out, we stick it in a Petri dish and we do a bunch of stuff to it and we say, whoa, this is a magnificent discovery. Look how this cell behaved in the Petri dish. Then we put the cell back into the body and nothing of the sort happens. And so what I'm saying is what God gave us is meant to thrive. We were meant to have it all. We were meant to have the libido of a lion. We were meant to have sleep like a bear. We were meant to have the waking energy of a freaking tiger. We were meant to have sharp, clear, cognitive function. We were meant to sleep deep, get a deep theta wave of sleep. We we're meant to have managed um, we were meant to have, uh, you know, managed emotional state. But the truth is, as you begin to deplete nutrients, you get the consequences of those disease. I, I, I don't think that we have a, a um, mental health crisis. I think we have a lack of mental fitness. You know? So, what, what, what do you mean by that, Gary? What do you mean by a lack of mental fitness? Well, what does it mean to be mentally fit, right? What is a mood? What is an emotional state? Right. Well, um, so let's talk about, you know, brain chemistry for a minute. Um, if you said to me, what is a mood? What is an emotional state? I would tell you that it's a collection of neurotransmitters, right? Bound to oxygen. So for example, every elevated emotional state that a human being can experience requires oxygen as a part of its molecular structure. So for example, passion, elation, joy, arousal, libido, all the sort of hell yeah, I won the lottery emotions, all require an elevated oxidative state. So if th this is the reason why no human being has ever woken up laughing. You don't have the oxidative state to experience laughter. But can you wake up angry? Yes, because anger does not require oxygen, neither does despair, jealousy, resentment. And so these are readily accessible emotions. So what happens is our physiology drags us down into the state where it most comfortably exists. 
So if you have a low oxidative state in the blood, low red blood cell count, low hemoglobin, um, you're anemic or even not anemic, but you're borderline anemic and your doctor tells you that you're normal. Well, now you have low levels of oxygen in the blood. You're not going to reach an elevated emotional state any, for any period of time other than something that looks like a heart monitor. And you're going to spend your life journaling and searching and reading self-help motivational books and trying to get in the right rooms and waking up in gratitude. And your emotional state is going to go right back down to where your physiology drags it. We need data on ourselves in order to drive a state of optimal health. You know, most entrepreneurs, it's astounding. They know more about their business than they know about their own blood. work. Um, they know more about their business than they know about their own, their nutrition. I do this all the time where I'll take young, hard charging, successful entrepreneurs. I'll bring them up on stage and I'll just say, Hey, how, um, you know, how much money did your business make last month? Um, you know, $662,400. Awesome. What were your net revenues? $144,315. Um, how many employees do you have? 16. What's your revenue employee employee? 72,400. Just out of curiosity, what's your glucose low? Um, where, what is your testosterone though? Um, do you have any idea um, what your insulin level is? Um, do you know where your D3 stands? Blank, right? That's astounding to me that we have more data on our business than we have on our temple. And right, so it's, and, and the temple is what's driving the business. <laughs> you know, the business isn't driving the temple. And, and so, um, you know, when, when, when you look at, you know, going back to mental fitness, um, where are these neurotransmitters made? Well, 90% of them are in your gut. 90% of the serotonin, the main driver of mood, dopamine, you know, the main driver of behavior, is made in the gut. We take an amino acid called tryptophan. We methylate it in the gut into um, a neurotransmitter called serotonin, goes up to the brain, creates a mood. What if you can't, what if you have an impaired conversion of um, tryptophan into serotonin? What if you can't convert phenylalanine and tyrosine at the right rate to um, dopamine? Well, now you get the expression of that disease. You know, we used to, for decades, we defined depression as an inadequate supply of serotonin. So the, the prevailing um, definition in all of modern medicine was, if you're low on serotonin, you're by definition depressed. You know, not one SSRI raises serotonin. So you would think if the definition is I have low serotonin, then the fix would be to raise serotonin. But that's not what we do. We actually take people that are depressed, we put them on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These, and what these do effectively, not exactly, but effectively they ration what little serotonin you have. So by definition, they never end depression. So by definition, um, you stay on these longer than, than you should. I mean, I have uh, clients come in all the time. I'm like, how long have you been on an antidepressant? 15 years, 18 years? I go, okay, well, when did you think it was gonna kick in? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but if we understand that these neurotransmitters that we're trying to raise are methylated in the gut, we understand that depression rarely begins in the outside environment. Same with anxiety, right? Same with ADD and ADHD. You know how many entrepreneurs are, are, are hindered by attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? ADD is, is, is not an attention deficit at all. It's an attention overload disorder. You see, in the human brain, we don't just create thought. We also dismantle thought. So if you don't break thought down, it's called catecholamines, a, a flood of neurotransmitters in the brain. If you don't break down catecholamines because you lack the complex of vitamins, you lack methylated B12, and you lack methylfolate, which are the big ones that help do this, um, then you are creating thought at a faster rate than you're breaking it down. And the mind becomes clouded. People that have ADD do not lack the ability to pay attention. They lack the ability to pay attention to so many things. And then we say, well, this is an attention deficit disorder. It's actually an attention overload disorder. And then what does modern medicine say? It says, well, if the mind is racing, then let's put an amphetamine into the body to race the central nervous system to match the pace of the mind. This is what Ritalin and Adderall and, and um, Vyvanse do, right? They're amphetamines. So now what happens? You create a non-physiologic response. You build a tolerance. You build um, a dependency, even worse. And now the only thing that's certain is that the dosage of that medication is going to go up and you are um, um, inhibiting, you're not raising the very neurotransmitter that the body needs. When, 
when our gut is healthy and when we have the right methylated vitamins in our body, this is why I think just about everybody should be taking a good vitamin D3 with K2 supplement. You definitely don't have to take mine. Gary, Gary, this is what I was going to say. So what you just did there was a very beautiful analysis of the things that are going wrong. The things that are going wrong in people's bodies are things that are, people that are going wrong in the medical system. So what are the solutions to this? How can people live a better and healthier life? And But Gary, by the way, before you answer, I just wanted to add, because I was about to ask yeah. you the same question, that uh, what I said to you before we started, which is there's a lot of people talking about medicine and how to be healthy and whatever on the internet. But I think one of the reasons we are so interested in talking to you is you've worked with a number of people, mm -hmm. Dana White being the most obvious example, where you literally see the transformation and Dana himself has come out and talked about the difference it's made in his quality of life as well. So the question is, if I'm an ordinary person listening to this, what do I do? How do I find out? What are some of the things that I may want to look out for as symptoms, et cetera? How do I get to the place Dana's getting without having his money? Yeah. So first, let me tell you four things that you can do that are absolutely free. Okay. And then I'll tell you four things that you need to do that are going to cost you next to nothing. Right. And you don't have to pay me for this. You, you, you can do this on your own. You know, first of all, one of the things that we have come to know in the in the anti-aging and longevity space, biohacking space, bio-optimization, whatever you want to call it, is that the further we get from the basics, the sicker we become. You, uh, human beings were meant to spend 85% of our time outdoors. We spend 97% of our time indoors now. We go from a covered house to a covered car, to a covered garage, to a covered office, to a covered mall. Right. I mean, we, 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 we don't spend much time outdoors. What do we get from Mother Nature? We get three things from Mother Nature. We get magnetism from the earth. We get oxygen from the air. We get light from the sun. You want to change the entire trajectory of your life. Put these four things into your life. They will cost you nothing and you can do them anywhere. Number one, try to get natural sunlight touching your skin once a day. Six, eight, 10 minutes is plenty. Um, because we are photovoltaic beings. Yes, you can go out and buy a $120,000 red light bed. I sell one, but you do not need that $120,000 red light bed to get the photovoltaic benefits that we can get from Mother Nature. And expose your skin to sunlight, preferably at first light, because during the first 45 minutes of the day, there's no UVA, there's no UVB rays, there's only healthy blue light from the sun. This will reset your cortisol receptors. It will reset your melatonin receptors. Um, and it will start the process of making vitamin D3 and it's free. The second thing you should learn how to do is um, learn how to do breath work. And the reason why I say this is there are four minute, six minute, eight minute breath work routines. I have an eight minute breath work routine. I do it religiously every single day. I don't think in 40 months I've missed a single day. I'll literally miss a commercial flight to not miss breath work. And um, because we can reset our circadian cycle by within 30 minutes of waking every day, finding a quiet place, preferably facing the sun, preferably outside, depending on the weather, and doing three rounds of 30 obnoxiously deep breaths with a breath hold in between. What does this do? Well, since the majority of us are not moving and we're not breathing, we lose these auxiliary muscles of respiration. Our diaphragm doesn't massage our intestines. We don't get oxygen down into the lobes of our lungs. So learn to do three rounds of 30 breaths. I follow a Wim Hof style of breath work. It's available for free all over the internet. It will take you eight minutes. You do it every morning within 30 minutes of waking to tell your body, this is what we do when we wake up. When you change time zones, you're doing it within 30 minutes of waking it will help reset your circadian rhythm. So expose your skin to sunlight and um, do eight minutes of breath work. The third thing you could do is a few times a week, more often if you can, but a minimum of three times a week, try to get bare feet touching bare grass, soil, dirt, sand. Come in contact with the surface of the, surface of the earth. Earthing and grounding is a very real thing. Um, it is not mumbo jumbo. It is not a bunch of spiritual nonsense. We discharge into the earth. If you actually look at human beings, um, we build up a charge and it is a complete fallacy that you can change the charge in the human body by drinking alkaline water. That's the biggest marketing myth ever sold to the public. You cannot change the pH of the blood by drinking alkaline water. You can by contacting the surface of the earth. pH stands for potential hydrogen. It is a charge. So if you want to repolarize the surface of your cells, contact the surface of the earth. You can also do this by buying an expensive PEMF map. They're about five grand. 
You don't need to do that. Contact the surface of the earth. And the third thing I would do is I would add an ice cold shower for 60 seconds to three minutes once a day. The majority of people are not going to take this advice because it's uncomfortable. But this routine will take you all of 10, 12 minutes to contact the surface of the earth, expose your skin to sunlight, do a round of breath work, take a cold shower. No need to buy an expensive cold plunge. You're going to shower today anyway. Just turn it as cold as it will get when you're done and step into that stream. And why do you want to constantly do this? Well, because the body has a process called hormesis where it is stressed and it strengthens in response. One of the worst things we continue to do is look at stress as being a negative for human beings. If you don't tear a muscle, it will not grow. If you don't load a bone, it will not strengthen. If you don't challenge the immune system, it will weaken. We are seeing right now the consequences of a globally weakened immune system. I'm probably going to lose 50% of your <laughs> audience on this next statement because people are like, oh, you're a political syncophant, whatever. I, I get attacked for it all the time. But the worst thing that we ever did to humanity, and I'm a human biologist, was residential quarantining, social distancing, and masking. I'm sorry. Yeah, you've just one of <laughs> our entire audience, well, yeah. Gary. Don't yeah. worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I lose half my Instagram followers every time I talk about, you know, no, 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 we're 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 very much with you on that one. Okay, so exactly. those those are four great things, and and you know what? It's so interesting to me what a lot of the stuff you're saying resonates with some of the stuff that I just know experientially. For example, you talk about the importance of the gut. Uh, this whole like Ayurvedic medicine is based entirely on the idea that you treat the body through food and nutrition and and the, and gut health. Mm -hmm. um, and the showers thing, we've been doing it for years, yeah. going to the sauna, doing the cold showers, cold plunges in between and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but I'm going to take on board all other stuff that you're saying because uh, I'd really love to give this all of this a go. You mentioned there's also some stuff that people uh, don't need to spend a huge amount of money on but can do as well. Can you talk to us about that? We'll get you back to the interview in a minute. But first, let me recommend an incredible alternative to coffee that will give you that all-day energy without the jitters in a delicious hot drink. Mud water is made with four functional mushrooms. Don't make things out of dysfunctional mushrooms. And only a fraction of the caffeine you'll find in a cup of coffee. So you'll get that natural energy without the crash. Each ingredient was added for a purpose. Cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and hot chocolate-like flavor. Lion's mane for focus. Cordyceps to promote natural energy. And both chaga and reishi to support a healthy immune system. It's quality stuff and tastes like cacao and chai had a baby. Why you'd want to drink a baby is anyone's guess, but there we are. Plus, it's Whole30 approved, 100% USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher. So not only does it taste great, you can also give it to your woke mates. Right now, you can save $20, plus get a free sample of creamer and a free frother by going to the link in the description below or heading to mudwtr.com slash trigonometry. That's mudwtr.com slash trigonometry to save $20 on your subscription and claim your freebies. And now, back to the show. Yeah, so there's three things that you need to permanently get out of your life, right? Because these are products of the Industrial Revolution. We were never meant to come in contact with these things. I, I think we just start with the premise that we have two choices, right? We can either filter our environment and we can filter things before they enter our body, or we can allow our body to be the filter. So for example, when I look at food, I, I literally look at food and I say, are you gonna serve me or are you gonna steal from me? Because if you're gonna steal from me, you're not coming into the temple. I don't care how pretty your suit is, how well you're dressed and how much, you know, how good the icing on the top looks. You're, if you're going to steal from me, you're not coming in. And it's a, it's a kind of an easy premise for me to guide my self because I, I, I put a very high value on my energy level. So number one, permanently get tap water out of your life. Um, uh, tap water has um, fluoride, it has chlorine, it has microplastics, it has pharmaceuticals. I'm talking about here in the United States and, and abroad. Fluoride is a, is a neurotoxin. It is a byproduct. It is a waste product from phosphate fertilizer manufacturing. It's called fluorosilicic acid. And we have to discard the fluorosilicic acid um, because if they kept it in fertilizer, it would kill the seed. 
So now we take this and we dump it into our municipal water supply. And every time that we drink water, we're getting fluoride, we're getting chlorine. In fact, if you want to do an amazing experiment at home, order a $1.50 or $1.99 chlorine testing kit. Okay. And these are little droppers that you can, you, you know, you take a glass of water, you can um, uh, put a few drops in. If it turns bright yellow, it's got the presence of chlorine. Fill up two glasses of water from your tap. Just do this sometime. Take two glasses of water from your tap, set them on the table. Put your fingers, four of your fingers down into one glass of water and leave them there for a minute. And take your fingers out and put the drops in both glasses of water. You will notice one glass of water is full of chlorine. The glass you put your fingers in has no chlorine. Why is that? Because it went into your skin. You see, because our bodies absorb that. And so I think that people should invest in a water filtration system. Uh, I, I, I think it's critically important. Um, I use one called an echo uh, water filtration system. Um, I also uh, use a, a hydrogenator. I hydrogenate all my water. I think it's the best water you can put in the human body. You just pour water into one of these things. You hit a button and it actually starts to make hydrogen water. If you look at the research on hydrogen water and how it feeds the gut um, and feeds a whole class of gut bacteria called hydrophiles and it gets uh, improves absorption of nutrients, supplements. So the first thing is get tap water out of your life. The second thing is to get GMO foods out of your life. If you look at the trajectory of research right now from 20, 2009 to 2023, we are now really beginning, beginning to realize the implication of using genetically modified foods and putting these into the human body. First of all, we didn't genetically modify seeds to increase the crop yield. We didn't genetically modify seeds to increase nutrition. We genetically modified seeds to make them resistant to glyphosate, a poison that is found in Roundup and insecticides. Um, so it's easy when you're going through the grocery store. This is part of what I mean about developing this mentality of filtering things. Filter your water before you put it in. Filter your food by just understanding some basics. I'm not going to eat GMO foods. And the third thing is not to ingest seed oils. Um, again, I got, I got shadow banned all over Instagram for a big expose that I did on seed oils. And I said, listen, I never said seed oils were bad for you. I said industrial process seed oils are bad for you. When you take a canola plant and you put it in a commercial press and it comes out gummy and then you degum it with hexane, a neurotoxin, and then you heat that degummed neurotoxic oil to 405 degrees, which turns it rancid, and then you um, deodorize it with sodium hydroxide, a known carcinogen, and then you bleach it and bottle it and put it on the shelf, that is one of the most toxic compounds you can put in the human body. It's increasing the rate of um, skin cancers, it's increasing the rate of atherosclerosis, arterial sclerosis, it's doubling the rate of cardiovascular disease, and these are unnatural things to put in the body. So those are three things that, that may add something to your budget. Water filtration, um, um, not getting, G, you know, getting GMO foods out of your uh, diet because non-GMO is slightly more expensive, and getting seed oils out of your diet. If you want to make it simple, get five oils. You can use a coconut oil, a ghee butter, a grass-fed butter or tallow for cooking, and you can use an extra virgin olive oil for all your room temperature stuff. It's really all you need. Um, you can do anything with those five. And if can you... you yeah, okay. sorry. Carry on, carry. If you want to take it to the next level, um, this is where you start to get data. I believe that every human being, once in their lifetime, needs to do what's called a genetic methylation test. And what is this test? It's usually a cheek swab that you send into a laboratory you can get them all over the place. You do not have to get the test through me. Um, there's all kinds of great genetic testing companies out there. You do a cheek swab, you send it in. When the results come back, this test will tell you, and this will never change. You only do this test once in your life. This test will tell you exactly what your body can convert into the usable form and what it can't. And then you supplement for that deficiency. I promise you the most magic things happen in human beings when you supplement for deficiency and not the sake of supplement, right? So many of us are caught up in whether or not a supplement is a good supplement. CoQ10, John's World, turmeric, curcumin, um, ashwagandha, NMN, nicotinic acid, you know, all of these supplements are great. The question is, do you need them? What is my body deficient in? Because if you hadn't put nitrogen into the soil of the plant, example I used before, everything, potash, whatever you put on that soil, you know, sodium, sulfur, calcium, it, the plant wouldn't heal. 
As soon as you give it the missing raw material, that's when magic happens. And you can find that on a genetic methylation test. That way, for the rest of your life, you'll never guess again on what you need to supplement with and whatnot. Here's my supplements right here. Um, <laughs> you know, where, where are they? Where, where, where? <laughs> See, I take a resveratrol. I take a... Um, trimethylglycine, I take a complex of um, methylated multivitamins, magnesium, and zinc. Not much. Um, and it's astounding. I post my blood work to Instagram roughly every 90 days so I can, sh you know, kind of battle the bro science community um, uh, and, and, and just, you know, put it out there. I have the same blood fat as a vegan and I get 75% of my caloric intake from fat. So Gary, what we're talking about here is revolutionary how can people get a hold of these particular type of uh tests is it are there lots of companies that do it are there very few yeah so you want to um um especially if you're outside the u.s you want to search for something called a genetic methylation test okay i specifically look at five genes i look at mthfr it's affectionately called the motherfucker gene <laughs> uh, I, I look at MTR, MTRR, I'm saying these slow so they can write them down, AHCY and COMT. You will cover such a dramatic, voluminous amount of consequences that people are chalking up to aging just by looking at those five genes and supplementing for those deficiencies. ADD, ADHD, OCD, manic depression, bipolar, you're um, very often hypertension, not always hypertension. People that have poor, poor gut issues, anyone with anxiety has to do that test. Anyone with depressive history has to do that test. If you have trouble sleeping, chances are you fit into one of two categories. You either lay down to go to sleep at night and you have a hard time falling asleep because your mind keeps you awake. Because as your environment quiets, your mind wakes up. And, and if you talk to people that have this consequence and you ask them, well, what are you thinking about? They'll say, I'm thinking about the most innocuous little nonsense, like whether or not I got everything on my you know, grocery list or whether or not I returned that email or my belt matched my shoes today. Um, and Or they fall asleep and they wake up because their mind wakes them up. This is a simple issue with excess catecholamines in the brain. As soon as you give the body the raw materials, L-methionine, SAMe, B-complex, a complex of B vitamins, methyl cobalamin, you see that the mind calms at night. And, and now people don't have a hard time falling asleep because it wasn't that they weren't tired, it's that their mind was awake. And so you want to see magic things happen in your body. Test for what it's deficient in and then just give it the raw material it needs to do its job. You'll be shocked how well it performs. Is this the reason, Gary, why so many people who have got anxiety and depression tend to have irritable bowel syndrome? It's exactly the reason why, right? Because where is 90% of the serotonin in the body? It's in the gut. If you don't have it here, you can't have it here. First of all, no one ever really defines what anxiety really is. I mean, what is anxiety? Well, anxiety is, we know, we know how to define it, right? We know that it's a fear of the future. It's a general, um, um, it's like a, a fight or flight feeling. But when we actually delve into anxiety and we, and we ask, you know, from a physiological standpoint, what is it? Well, first of all, um, we have to understand that the brain, as sophisticated as we'd like to think it is, it's, it's, it's really not, right? It's that the brain is actually very primal, right? You know what the brain cares about? It cares about survival. And it's nasty. Like, it's like the little Kim Jong-un of dictators. Sits up there, takes everything for itself, right? If it wants calcium, it'll leach it from the bones. If it wants amino acids, it'll strip it from lean muscle. If it wants sugar, it'll activate a receptor on the back of the tongue and give you a dopamine reward for giving it sugar. But when we talk about anxiety, um, we also have to understand that the brain doesn't understand the difference between perception and reality. So I always use the example that if you drove home tonight and you got out of your car, and somebody was standing in front of you with a knife, you would instantly have a fight or flight response, right? Pupils would dilate, your heart rate would increase, your extremities would flood with blood. You'd start having a fight or flight response. Gary, but, we live in London, we're used to it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, hey brother, I put the knife down, what do you, what do you need? Here's, the, here's 10 pounds, leave me alone. <laughs> I have actually heard that. The last time I was in London, my buddy told me not to wear my watch out. I go, what? Get where you're watching, London, LA, no. New York, and now London. Ah. 
Um, so, but think about this. I'm on the 30th floor of a condo building right now, right? So you could be sitting, you could be laying in my bed in there and start thinking about getting eaten by a shark. Hmm. And the chance of a shark getting out of that ocean, whoops, getting <laughs> out of that ocean and coming up that elevator are zero. But you can have the exact same response. Why is that? Because the same cascade of neurotransmitters that showed up when that guy was in front of you with a knife is the one that shows up when you thought about getting eaten by a shark. So once you understand that you don't need the presence of a fear to feel fear, you start to understand the genesis of anxiety. So if we take it a step further, what's creating that fear? A class of neurotransmitters called catecholamines. And when they rise in the brain, you get the presence of fear. You don't have to be on the 30th floor of a balcony and walk to the edge. You don't have to be claustrophobic and step on a crowded elevator. You don't have to be afraid of flights and getting on an airplane. You can be sitting on a podcast like we are right now, and people that suffer from anxiety could be, start becoming overwhelmed with anxiety. Um, and the worst thing you can do is try to reason them out of having anxiety. You know, tell them there's no reason to feel that way, there's, there's nothing wrong with you, there's nothing to be afraid of. But at the end of the day, um, if we understand that this is a rise in catecholamines in the basic B complex and L-methionine and methylfolate are what degrade these catecholamines, then why wouldn't we try putting those raw materials back into the human body to see if we could permanently put anxiety in our rear view mirror? People don't want it to be that simple, but very often it is. Well, I, I, Gary, uh, it's really, I'm glad, I've seen a couple of your interviews, uh, but I'm really glad we had you on to talk about this stuff because I am genuinely going to go out and give all of this a go. I've been meaning to for a long time, but um, it, I'm very keen to see how it works out. And uh, maybe I'll report back and see, see how it goes as well. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I'd love to as well, Gary, because yeah. uh, uh, what you were talking about, particularly when it comes to anxiety, as somebody who has anxiety, and ADHD, and you know, you do the meditation, you work out, you do, you know. I mean, those things help. Those are all coping mechanisms. Yeah. They yeah. teach you to cope, right? You're just adding power to the motor mm. to get through it. We're talking about removing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I definitely, definitely want to, I'm definitely going to give this a go. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, yeah. uh, before we let, before we move on to questions from our supporters uh, on locals and uh, elsewhere, uh, our last question in the in the main interview is always the same, which is, what is the one thing we're not talking about uh, at the level of our society that we should be? Um, um, the commonality between all of us, you know, um, it's it's interesting how much flack I get when I do posts with certain people. I do a post with Dana White. People go, "He's an atheist. How do you work with him?" I do a post. Sure. With Grant Cardone, they're like, he's a Scientologist. How could you? I do a post with Steven Seagal, and they're like, he's a Putin supporter. How could you? I said, because I see a human being. And, and I don't ask for your political or religious affiliation or anything else, nor do I really care. I, I see a human being. And there is much more that we have in common than we have um, in, in differences. And I think, sadly, um, our governments are doing a very good job at pointing out the differences and dividing us. I mean, when I was growing up, it used to be okay to be a Republican at a Democratic dinner and just talk about your business. Now you can't even be in the same house. Um, and and I think that's the first thing. And, 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 this, and the second thing is, um, I don't think that we're talking about basic nutrition enough anymore. What we allow into our food supply and processed foods and the amount of... Um, um, sugars that we allow into the human diet and and this this theory of single dose toxicity which is horrible we should use something called cumulative dose toxicity to determine whether or not something is poisonous um to me is a travesty because people uh sadly trust our government and uh they trust them to keep them healthy and keep their water clean and keep their food nutritious and and none of that is is very true all right, well, Gary, listen, thank you so much. Uh, head on over with us uh, to Locals and elsewhere uh, for questions with our supporters. Let's fire it up. What is the importance of sleep to general health, brain function, weight, etc.? 